This is a hands-on introduction to OpenMP. Over the course of the day, we will assume we're starting from nothing, and we're going to build you up to be able to write serious OpenMP code. So, so, so that's, that's the goal. Now, I do work for Intel, and I want to just say that I work in the parallel computing labs in Intel. Um, since I'm in a lab, that means I know nothing about Intel products. So if you ask me a question about an Intel product, don't trust anything I say. I don't know what I'm talking about, really. Uh, so nothing I say should be construed to mean anything at all about an Intel product. And just to make sure you really know that fact, we have all this fine print right here. So uh, yeah, I'm not saying anything about Intel products. The other thing on this, 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 all this text is that I'm going to give performance numbers. Do not assume that you will ever be able to replicate those performance numbers, OK? Gosh, don't you just love lawyers? They make life so much better for all of us. <laughs> now, the way I do things, though, is I have found over the years that the less I talk and the less I lecture, the better. The more that you're actually writing code and doing things, the more you will actually learn. So um, this is not lecture all day. You do exercises in the evening. The idea here is I lecture a little bit, you code a little bit. So I have lots of little itty bitty tiny little exercise fragments we're we'll doing throughout the day. So that means step number one is you need to be on a system where you can use an OpenMP compiler. You can do all of these on BlueGene, or you can do, which is the, I guess, Vesta. Um, or you can do all of these on an x86 cluster, which is Cooley. Um, for some of you, you can do it right there on your laptops. I do everything right on my laptop. Uh, and that's fine if you have OpenMP on your laptops. But you know, basically, the first exercise, which we'll come to in a little while, is just to make sure that you're on some system where you can use OpenMP. So that's, that's step one. And I will come back to this slide later, because it has things like, what are the actual compiler flags you need and that sort of thing. I just want to emphasize I am not speaking for my employer. See, I'm going to say that three or four times, so maybe it sinks in. So just remember, I'm not speaking for Intel. Uh, and I'm not speaking for the OpenMP Architecture Review Board. So these are all my opinions. Um, but we take these tutorials very seriously. So, you know, during the course of the day, if there's exercise suggestions you have or something you think that we could have done better, please jot down a note to yourself about it. And at some point today, give it to me. Because we really like to make these better and better each time. So the plan for today is, is active learning. Um, as little talking as possible, as much doing as we can get away with. You need to follow a few simple rules. As you will see, I give you all the exercises and I give you the solutions. This is not a competition to show your peers how smart you are by you solving the problems really fast. Because of course, anyone can look at the solution and then immediately have it done. If you do that, you will learn nothing. So you know, try the exercises. Some of them, if, if, the, 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 if the concept is new to you, are frustrating by design. That's OK. So you know, adult learners learn through frustration. So some of them are designed to be a little bit frustrating. So don't cheat and don't look at the solutions. You know, they're there for your own self-study after the, the fact. Now, the other thing I want to mention is um, many of you probably have some degree of OpenMP experience already. All right? Your job, if the exercise is just so trivial, your job is to play. All right, you know, what happens if I ask for a million threads? You know, what, what happens if I overflow the thread stack? You know, play, beat the system up. You know, and the other thing is if you have, you know, quite a bit of OpenMP experience, um, you know, appoint yourself my TA and help the people around you. You know, the fact of the matter is none of us knows so much that we can't learn by playing and experimenting with these. So this is an introduction to OpenMP. It assumes you know nothing. For those of you who do know quite a bit already, use this as an opportunity to play, to dig deeper, to explore corners that you might not be uh, do on your own. All right. Does that sound very clear? We are, we're, all, we're all on the same page? Good. Then let's move on. Here is the plan for the day. We're going to go over you know, the OpenMP core concepts and some simple examples about you know, how we create threads and some of the foundations of where OpenMP comes from. 
Then we'll have a section after the break where we go through how to really work with threads, synchronization, parallel loops, and then just a whole collection of the constructs you need, like the single and the master, and some of the constructs you need to really work with OpenMP. Then after lunch, things are going to get much more complicated, I hope, uh, as we start digging into managing the data environment. And then we have this really wonderful exercise uh, where we actually talk about uh, how to debug OpenMP code and digging into more complicated code that's with the Mandelbot set area. Then we move into features of OpenMP that are less commonly used, but we believe over time will become extremely important. And these are the tasking models within OpenMP. So we'll spend some time playing around with tasks. Then later in the afternoon, we're going to uh, dig into the memory model because I'm a memory model kind of guy and I like them. And we'll talk about thread private. Then we have another larger scale application with this Monte Carlo uh, application, which could take a while. Then in the uh, late part of the day, I'll spend just a little while. And at this point, we'll get probably mostly into just lecture mode as we talk about SIMD and then devices and OpenMP, which is basically how to program a GPU with OpenMP. All right, that's the plan for the day. Does that, does that sound reasonable? I hope so, OK. If not, you're out of luck, because that's what we're going to do. So. <laughs> All right, so let's jump right in. OpenMP is, is my proudest accomplishment. You know, I was, I was part of the very original first group that sat down and said, you know what we need to do? We need to agree on how to spell parallel do. You know, let's all just agree on how to spell that. And, and so, um, you know, it's just a set of compiler directives and a small number of library routines. And the goal of OpenMP, and this is really was our goal starting out. I think we're losing sight of that these days. But it was about what's the easiest system we can come up with so that would allow someone to write multi-threaded code. And that someone's not a computer scientist, that someone is a physicist, an engineer, a domain specialist who, who doesn't want to get bogged down in the details of P threads or C++ 11 threads. or They just don't want to go there. So our goal was to make it as easy as we could. And uh, I like to joke that it's my proudest accomplishment. It's probably the most boring thing I've ever done. Because especially at the beginning, what our goal was is there should be nothing new that goes into a standard. The standards are supposed to codify existing practice. And that was very much what OpenMP was about at the beginning is, you know, look, we had an emerging practice on what to do with shared memory, symmetric multiprocessor systems. Let's just agree on how to spell all of that. So at its birth, at the beginning of OpenMP, it was really focused on a hardware model that looked like this, a collection of processing elements that have access to a shared address space. Now, this is a symmetric multiprocessor system in that every single processor is equal in the eyes of the operating system. And there is equal time access to any location in memory. So that was the system that OpenMP was, was defined uh, around, a symmetric multiprocessor. So question, can any of you name a system you can buy today that actually looks like this? The answer is no. <laughs> the, the second we put a cache on a microprocessor, we broke this model. So right from the beginning, there's this disconnect. But that was the route we went, all right? Then above that, you have the system layer. And here you have the operating system, which provides support for the threads. So we just use what we're given by the operating system. So typically, it's P threads. I hope as the C++11 standards and beyond become more entrenched, that will eventually become uh, the, the, you know, the C and C++ threading models. But we take whatever threading model the system gives us. On top of that, there's a layer of software that OpenMP writes, which call, is called the runtime library. And it manages the low-level interface to those uh, threads. Then on top of that is the programming interface. And this is what we're going to talk about today. It's the directives that work with the compiler. There's a number of routines in an OpenMP library we expose to programmers. And then there's a bunch of environment variables. And then, of course, on top of that, you've got your applications and the end user running them. So this is the basic solution stack. And this picture here 
represents what OpenMP looked like from version 1.0 to version 3.1. Now moving into modern times, what we now have done is we finally realized that, you know what, we need to really think in terms of a messier hardware picture and deal with the fact that every single machine you could actually buy today has a non-uniform uh, memory architecture. So we're adding constructs with places, processor bindings, teams, additional constructs, and this is in the 4.0 and on to 4.5. By the way, the, the release of OpenMP out today is 4.5. Um, so we're embracing the NUMA model, and um, I, I guess that's all I want to say right there. And then even more recently, and I'll talk about this at the end of the day, in 4.0, we added a target directive. So this is basically how would I program things like a GPU, uh, or how would I program like a Xeon Phi from a Xeon system. OpenMP started in this little clean, nice little SMP world, and now, of course, we're taking over the node. The idea is to make it so that you use MPI in between nodes, and you use OpenMP on a node, no matter what that node is composed of. And that's kind of the model that we're embracing moving forward. So the, the, the core syntax of OpenMP is pragma-driven. Almost all of the action happens through these pragmas. And the pragma always has this common form. Pragma, OMP, the construct name, and then a, section, uh, a collection of optional clauses. So an example, pound pragma OMP num threads four. That pragma there says, I would like you to create a team of threads. I request that there be four of them. And that's what that pragma says. Now, uh, you have to pick up your function prototypes. So at the top of an OpenMP program, oh, and a few types. So at the top of an OpenMP program, you're always going to have include OMP.h. Or if you're in the Fortran world, use OMP.live. I hope you're all comfortable with C, by the way. We're doing everything in C today. I hope that's okay. Is that a problem for anyone? Oh, good. Oh, one. You're brave to admit it. Thank you. I, I appreciate it. Are you a Fortran person? All right. If you have to use Fortran, that's okay. We'll talk. Just come talk to me. All right. One concept I want to get across is an OpenMP, a construct typically applies to what we call a structured block. And I found in talking about OpenMP, it's useful just right up front define what a structured block is. And then I don't have to talk about it anymore. You just assume that after the pragma comes a structured block. There, and there's just a few exceptions to that. A structured block is a block of code. And there's only one point of entry at the top of that code and one point of exit at the bottom of that code. Uh, you don't have branches into the middle. You don't have branches out of the middle. Now, we do allow an exit statement inside that branch. So you, know, you, can, you can jump out of the middle of a structured block if what you want to do is to shut down the program. All right? But a structured block, you basically you enter at the top, you exit at the bottom. And if you just think for a moment what the compiler does with your code that has pragmas, it has to look at those pragmas. Uh, compiler people call it outlining. It's where they go through and they look at the code and they turn it into functions that they can then pass on to a runtime system to do something with. So the compiler has to make assumptions about what's going to happen with that code so it can intelligently transform it behind the scenes into a function. And so we're basically helping the compiler out and saying, compiler, you're our friend here. I promise you, you can just enter this block of code at the top and just put a return statement at the bottom. And we're not going to do anything nasty to you in the middle. So that's what we mean by structured block. All right, so now we come to exercise one. And here's what I want you to do, all right? On your system of choice, I don't care if it's your laptop, if it's Vesta, or if it's Cooley, um, I want you to open up a text editor of your choice and have a program that's going to print hello and world, all right? That's what I want you to do. Write a hello world program. Now, for those of you who might be using Vesta or Cooley, I want to go back to that slide I had way at the beginning that gives the details of what you need to do on those two machines to call up a compiler that's going to use OpenMP. 
Um, so if you're choosing Vesta, if you're choosing Cooley, uh, you may need the appropriate box on, on this slide. All right? Go for it. Those of you who aren't quite at Hello World yet, don't worry. You'll still have more time because I have another assignment for people. This is part two of the exercise. I want you to go through and just put the pound include omp.h. And just, we'll explain how this works in a moment. I just want you to put pound pragma omp parallel open bracket, close bracket. And then compile it with the OpenMP switch enabled on the compiler line, and then run the executable. All right? And the purpose of this exercise is to make sure that not only can you use an editor, believe me, there are times I teach this course, people don't even know how to use VI or Emacs or whatever the editor they want to use. I'm just showing with this exercise that you know how to use an editor and that you know how to call a compiler that has the OpenMP directive. Let me explain what it is that you just did with that program. So pound include bracket omp.h, that's the include file. It has function prototypes and it defines the few types that OpenMP uses. Then that pragma, pound pragma OMP parallel, this is where I create a parallel region and I request a number of threads. And I will say more about that later. But every system has a concept of a default number of threads. And so what's going to happen right there is I'm asking for the default number of threads. Now I added something on you in my version of this. Int ID equals OMP get thread num. That's the first OpenMP library call we need to, to think about. Basically, most of the action in OpenMP happens through the compiler. A pragma is you telling the compiler, hey, compiler, do this for me. All right? But asking what your thread ID is, your thread number, is something that can't be done at compile time. So that's why we have some library routines that you have to call in OpenMP. There's not very many of them we're going to use, but one you're going to use again and again and again is OMP get thread num. And it is the same concept as a rank in MPI. Your thread numbers go from zero to the number of, uh, the number of threads minus one. All right? So then, just to keep things interesting, I have hello, and it's going to return the thread ID of who printed hello. And then on a separate print, I have world, and it's going to return the ID of the thread that called the world. And when I run it, I'm going to get something like this. Hello, one. Hello, zero. World, one. World, zero. Hello, three. Hello, two. World, three. World, two. All right? What I want to emphasize is what's happening is you have a collection of threads, and they're all doing these same activities and dumping onto the output. And they're going to run in some interleaved order. All right? It's not going to be the case that I get hello, zero, world, zero. Hello, one, world, one. Hello, two, world, two. Nope, they're going to interleave. The challenge of multi-threaded programming is you have to make sure that every legal way that they can interleave still gives you a correct result. If you really want to get down to what makes multi-threaded programming hard, that's it. So you have to read the program and say, every single way that's interleaved, it's going to still give me the right result. Because the operating system chooses how it interleaves the threads. The operating system manages how the threads interact with shared resources. You don't. So you have to make sure that they all work out correctly. So that's a very important concept. So any questions? All right, then let's, let's move on. So if, if you're hoping to take a nap, this is the, oh, yes, do you have a question? Uh, so without uh, setting the number of thread, how do, uh, like, uh, always decide, like, how many number of threads should be there? Right. So we will talk about this at length later, but I'm going to quickly answer your question. 
So uh, there is something called an internal control variable associated with the program. I could get all jargon rich and say all this other stuff, but it just gets confusing. Let's just say, for the program, as it's executing, there's an internal control variable. And there's one of those internal control variables is what's the default number of threads? So the system keeps track. If I just go pragma OMP parallel, I am requesting the default number of threads. Now, the standard requires that there's this control variable that defines that default. It doesn't tell an implementation what that default should be. So it's implementation defined. On my laptop, oops, my laptop in my backpack, <laughs> uh, I have a dual core processor with hyper-threading enabled. The operating system thinks I have four cores. The default number of threads is four. I think on Cooley it might be 12, but it depends. It's completely up to the environment what the default number of threads is. We will talk about how to change that. We will talk about how to request numbers of threads. All right, so here is all of OpenMP in one slide. All right. OpenMP is a multi-threading shared address space model. And the threads communicate by sharing variables. All right, variables sit in the shared address space. Threads interact through uh, those sharing variables. And that's the heart of OpenMP. Now, what makes this so difficult is if you have uh, a race condition due to uh, undisciplined reads and writes of those shared variables. This is that interleaving problem. If some of those threads are reading and writing variables and they interleave in different ways, I may get different answers depending on when they're hitting those shared variables. All right, that's a race condition. The program's output changes depending on how the threads are scheduled. Race conditions are evil. Um, they're really obnoxious. And we'll say a lot more about how obnoxious they are later. So you control race conditions by using synchronization constructs. The synchronization constructs, for example, give you a way of saying, I want to make sure only one thread at a time does this right. All right, synchronization, though, is pathetically expensive. You have to go to great lengths to minimize how much you synchronize in a multi-threaded program. How do you do that? You do that by managing the data environment and how it's accessed. And by doing that, you minimize the need to synchronize. All right, so we're going to talk about creating threads. We're going to talk about how they interleave and think about data races. We're going to talk about how to synchronize to eliminate data races or, mod or modify your algorithm to eliminate data races. And then we're going to talk about the data environment that you can manage to eliminate synchronization. And that's OpenMP. So if you're a manager, which I think none of you are, this is when you can go to sleep and just ignore the rest of the day. Uh, but if you really want to understand OpenMP, let's go a little deeper. So fundamentally, at the core of threading, any threading system like OpenMP, is the fork join model of parallelism. And this is a nice little picture for the fork join model. So you have a single thread, which we call the master thread. And on my brilliant slide, it is colored red. So the master thread is colored red. Gosh, I could start a career as a Dr. Seuss-like writer. Okay. At some point, you're cruising along in the thread, your serial program, and you hit a point in the code where, gee, wouldn't it be nice if I had some friends to help me out? Okay, so then you create a team of threads. We call this step where you create a team of threads, you have forked a collection of threads. So bam, you get other threads to help you, and they're going to cooperatively execute that code. So I've created a team of threads. So now they're going to go off, and they're going to work together over the, a block of code. And when they're done, they join back together at this point. And after the join, only one thread continues, which is that master thread. And we do indeed guarantee that physically to the operating system, that same master thread at the beginning is the same physical thread at the end. The master thread is the same physical thread throughout. Later on, you come to a point in the code where, gee, I've got some more work I could do in parallel. All right, I'm going to fork off more threads. And so it happens again. And I want to stress it doesn't have to be the same number. It can be a different number of threads each time. So we call these pieces of code these areas, these regions where you have a team of threads, we call them parallel regions. And so you have parallel regions, and in between, you have these things called sequential parts. 
All right, so your program is these sequential parts, fork off a team of threads, we have the parallel region, you come back to another sequential part, and they can be nested. So inside of a parallel of a thread in a team, it could say, hey, I could use a few more threads. So then you create more threads. And then that thread that created them right here becomes the master of its little inner team. So this is nested parallelism. And OpenMP from day one defined nested parallelism. And uniformly, the people implementing OpenMP I know from hate nested parallelism, which irritates me to no end because I think it's a beautiful little concept. But then you get into oversubscription if you're not careful. and You have more threads than you have processors. And uh, things get really interesting there. All right, so let's talk about how you create a parallel region. So the only way to create threads in OpenMP is with a parallel construct. If you don't have a parallel, you don't have multiple threads. So to create a four-thread parallel region, I, um, I have uh, a call called OMP set num threads. Now, what that call does is it tells the system change the internal control variable for the default number of threads to this value. So OMP set num threads four says, system, I'd like the internal control variable for the default number of threads to now read four. All right, that's that library call does. OMP set num threads. Now we get to the pragma OMP parallel. And that pragma OMP parallel now has a structured block of code associated with it, open bracket, close bracket, okay? And in that structured block, I have OMP ID equals OMP get thread num in this case, and then I call a function poo uh, ID and, and A. All right? So that's it. Now that array A, I declared outside the parallel region. Because I did that, it is shared. All of the threads are seeing that same array. Most implementations of OpenMP, that array is sitting on the heap. And as you know if you've, from your operating systems course long, long ago, which course most of you never took an operating systems course, I didn't either. I've never taken any computer science course. I've taught them, but I've never taken any. But at any rate, <laughs> um, it's on the heap. All the threads can see it. Okay. As a first order of approximation, if variables are declared before the parallel region, they're visible to all the threads. They're shared. If they're declared inside the parallel region, then they are private to the threads, and only the threads can see them. So with this code, and I'm going to say this two or three more times so that it will really sink in, but this int ID is declared in the parallel region, so it's separate for each thread, has its own int ID. It goes onto the thread stack. If it's declared inside those curly brackets, it sits on the thread stack, and just the thread can see it. If it's declared before the parallel region, it goes into the process heap so all the threads can see it. Now, another little subtlety here. Um, a parallel region, I request a number of threads. So I am saying a parallel region, give me four threads, please. And the system can come back and say, no, I don't like you today. You insulted me yesterday. I'm only going to give you three threads. All right. Now, <laughs> the, the reason that was written into the spec, that you request a number of threads, but the system can choose to give you fewer threads, is the case, well, think about today. You're all on a blue gene login node. And if each and every one of you asks for 128 threads, what's going to happen? You know, it might get ugly. So it, we, we wrote into the spec that the runtime system has the flexibility to go through and say, you know what, my usage policy right now, I don't want to give any one person more than three threads. And so it can silently, without telling you, give you fewer threads than you asked for. All right? All right? Now, that, I have a few moments during the day that I call head nod moments that I need to make sure you really got the concept, so I need to see you go like this. So does everyone got that? OK, everyone, did you not get it? You didn't nod your head. Did you not get Do you have a question? Uh, how do we know uh, the number of threads actually the runtime uses? Ah, there's a runtime call I'll show you in just a few slides. So yes, so there's a runtime call. Oh, it, uh, uh, there's, there's a call, OMP get. OK, we have OMP set num threads. There's an OMP get num threads. 
So there's a runtime call that lets you get. So with that question, now can you nod your head? Ah, good. All right. Yes, in the back. Um, if you declare the, in the previous example, if you declare the ID uh, before the pattern region, yes, that should be uh, shared between all the threads. Yes. And when you extract the ID inside the pattern region, yes, that means you're writing to the same variable. Yes. So shouldn't it be mangled at any particular time? Shouldn't it be what? Uh, shouldn't it give a garbage value because multiple yes. threads are? It, well, wait a minute. OK. So let, let, let me repeat this for everyone's benefit, because you are raising such an utterly important point with that question. Because as you'll quickly see with OpenMP, there, well, there aren't that many constructs. So what makes multi-threaded programming so hard? It's these little issues of how many threads did I actually get? How am I actually writing into shared versus private? So his question was, what if I declared int id not right here? What if I declared it right after that double? So now id is a shared variable. So now what's happening is when each thread calls omp get thread num and tries to write into that value, they're stomping on each other. When I do a print of that later on, I don't know what I'll get. I could get, you know, it, it could be partway through one write. I might, I might not get int values. I could get any kind of craziness. Because halfway through one thread writing the number one into that thread, another thread could start writing the number two into that thread, and they could conflict, OK? That is called a data race. Now, in modern language design, including OpenMP, there is a little piece of fine print in the language definition. This is true in Java. This is true in C. This is true in C++. It's true in OpenMP. It's true in OpenCL. They, they pretty much all modern languages are doing this now. And they say the following. If your program contains a data race, then the program is non-determinate. It's an illegal program. And the compiler can do anything it wants because you wrote an illegal program. All right? So the answer to putting that ID prior to the parallel region is you now have a data race, and your program's utterly garbage. And the compiler can do anything it wants because you were stupid enough to write a data race. All right? And they put that escape clause in because what they, what they didn't want to have to do is define what reasonable thing would happen if you did that. This gives them complete freedom to not even try and do something reasonable. Should you be dumb enough to write a data race? All right? Now, here's the problem with that. I'm going to mention it briefly here. But here's the problem with that. What do you think the chances are for you to write a 100-line program that's multi-threaded that has a data race? OK? What are the chances that you're going to do that? Well, let me give you a little, little story. There's a company, because this is being collected on videotape, I won't name the company. <laughs> and this company was working with a whole bunch of software vendors who would bring their applications into this company, and they would analyze them for them for their multi-threaded content to help them create fast, good multi-threaded codes. And I will not name any of these companies, but if I did, you would recognize every single one of them in this story. These were the big, commercial, serious codes with professional multi-threaded programmers. All right. Every single multi-threaded program that came in for analysis had race conditions, had data races, without exception. And you will see as you start writing code that, you know, yes, in these little four-line examples, you can inspect the status of every variable, and you can know the status of every variable. Move that up to 1,000 lines. Heck, 100,000. OK, let's get big, a million. OK, you're not going to be able to inspect that. And the second you start putting pointers and dynamic memory in there, you can't statically know if you have a data race or not. So this is why it's always bothered me that compiler writers have too much power and got away with putting that escape clause in there so that they now can say, if there's a data race, we don't have to do anything reasonable. You screwed up, dude. Suffer. <laughs> As an application developer, my PhD is theoretical chemistry. I'm all about applications. It's like, no, I want you compiler writers to suffer. And tell me, what's the reasonable thing you're going to put in there? 
Uh, at any rate, I could go on and on and on and on, but you know, the, the, it's, it's actually very scary because it's difficult to write code that is race-free. It is difficult to ever prove that a multi-threaded program is race-free. But data races can blow things up in very, very ugly ways. But we, we will go on. And believe me, as the day goes on, you will probably write your own data races and experience this for yourself. Yes? Uh, I, maybe I did not understand the previous question properly, but if you have uh, OMP get thread number before the OMP parallel, then what are we getting just the thread ID of the master thread? So, let's see if I can do this. This isn't my laptop, so it's kind of hard talking theoretically about these things. Sheesh. OK. So this is what we're talking about with getting the race condition, that I declared ID up there. So now all the threads are stomping on the same memory address. That's a data race. Now, if I did this, What do you think I'd get? I don't know what you'd get. It's undefined. You're not in a parallel region. It doesn't mean anything. You know, maybe you'd get zero, but it's 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 meaningless because I'm not calling it inside a parallel region. Okay. So you need, you know, the thread number really doesn't have meaning until you're inside a team of thread. Because that thread number call says, who am I inside the team? A good implementation might return zero there, but uh, you know if you're outside a parallel region, it doesn't really mean anything anyway. So yes. So uh, the set num threads. Uh, what's the behavior if uh, two threads uh, call set num threads themselves? This one is parallel. He asks the question: What happens if multiple threads call OMP set num threads, and they have a different value, right? All right, this is why I went to all the trouble to define an internal control variable. So the OpenMP specification, actually download it and read it. It is a very well-written specification. It, it really is. Um, I'm very proud of that specification. And it is extremely carefully written. All right, so notice what I said. There is an internal control variable. And those internal control variables are attached to each thread. And when I call OMP set num threads, what I am doing is changing the value of an internal control variable. So from there, we can deduce exactly what would happen with your question. One thread would have its internal control variable for the default number of threads set to four. And a number thread thread would have its internal control variable for the default number of threads set to a different value. Okay. And all that does is it means the next time they set a parallel, how many threads they would create. So if one thread had the value 4, the other had the value 3, then another thread comes along, it calls a parallel, it asks for 4 threads, the other one calls for 3. So things are very, very carefully defined so, to deal with those situations. There's another way to ask for a number of threads. And this is our first clause. Pound pragma OMP parallel creates a team of threads, and I'm requesting for this team only, so I'm not changing the default value. I'm just saying, for this team, give me four threads. So the clause is num underscore threads, then parentheses, an integer expression calling for a number of threads. Now, in both cases, though, here's what happens, and this is just to, to belabor the obvious, to make sure you really do understand what's going on here. All right? Imagine I did indeed get four threads. All right? So there's the code to remind us what it looks like. Double A of 1,000, so I've created an array of size 1,000. 
I request the default number threads at four. I open up my parallel region. So, okay, great. I'm now going to get a team of one, two, three, four threads. Okay, I'm calling poo with ID and A, but I declared ID inside the parallel region, so it goes on each thread stack. So when I call poo, I'm going to have poo of 0A on thread 0, poo of 1A on thread 1, poo of 2A on thread 3, or the third thread, and poo of 3A on the fourth thread. All right? And they all see the same copy of A. They all have their own copy of ID. Then when they're done, we get to the end here, and they all wait here. No thread goes on until everyone arrives at the end. This is called a barrier, and I know because you just had MPI yesterday, you all know what a barrier is. All right? So there's a barrier at the end, and nobody proceeds. Of course, only the master is going to proceed because we're at the join at the end. So after all the threads finish, then the master continues to print that we're all done. Any questions here at all? Good, because we're now coming up on our first juicy exercise. All right, this is cool. Now, um, in the world of parallel programming, the most single most abused example is the numerical integration example we have right here. How many of you have done this one before? Wow, not 100%. OK. <laughs> so we, we pick an integral that just coincidentally equals pi if you do it right. So this is wonderful, because you can know if you're getting an approximation to the right answer. All right? Integral from 0 to 1 of 4 over 1 plus x squared dx equals pi. So I can approximate the area under the curve as a set of rectangles, add up all those rectangles, and I will get something that hopefully looks like pi. And there we go is the serial version of that program. Now, on that first slide way back, I hope you all did it. But if you didn't, do it now. In project slash ATPESC 2016 slash OpenMP, you will find the directory with all the exercises. Copy that directory into your own personal working space. I have a copy of that on Cooley. I have a copy of that on Vesta. If you're working on your own laptop, copy the version from Cooley or Vesta onto your laptop. If that's too hard for you, I've got a, a USB drive in my pocket with a tar file. So one way or the other, get that in there. Because, because I'm a nice guy, there is a function there, a program there called pi.c, which is this code. So you don't have to write it yourself from scratch. All right, so here is your assignment. Whoa, yes. I want you to create a parallel version of that program, OK? A parallel version of that Pi program. Now, for those of you who know OpenMP already, I don't want you to do the shortcuts. All you are allowed to use, and I strictly mean this, all you're allowed to use from OpenMP is get num threads, which is a library call to ask for how many threads are in my team. Uh, you can use get thread num. That's who, what's the thread ID, or its rank in the team. All right. Uh, then for getting times, there's a function OMP get w time. You know this already because it's exactly like the MPI w time call. That's by design. And then the OMP set num threads to request a number of threads in the team. That's all you are allowed to use. So even if you know other constructs in OpenMP, don't use them here. Do the Pi program just with those. OK, how's it going? Does anyone have Pi in parallel yet? Oh, wow, one. OK, here's my hint slide. So of course you're going to use a, a pound pragma OMP parallel to create a bunch of threads. Your challenge is how you're going to divide those loop iterations between different threads. You have to look at it and figure out how you're going to do that. Well, clearly the only mechanism I've given you to do that is by looking at the thread ID. So somehow you're going to have to figure out a way 
to if I'm thread ID 0, I do these iterations. If I'm thread ID 1, I do these iterations, you know, and so forth. So intellectually, that's a big challenge here. The second big challenge is I'm doing a sum. I'm doing an accumulation. We don't have a reduction operator that I've given you yet. So you're going to have to do that accumulation on your own. So how am I going to write an accumulator, a way to accumulate the data for each thread that I can later combine into a single global, but without a data race? So how am I going to do that? So those are the two big challenges that you're given. All right? And just then at the bottom here, I'm just repeating the, the function so you don't have to memorize function prototypes. So think about that. And by all means, if, if you get stuck, you are surrounded by an incredible intellectual capital in this room. So talk to your neighbors. Talk to the people around you. Converse. Let's make this room noisy as you all interact and think about how you're going to solve these problems. Let me show you my solution to this problem. So I'm not going to go into it in, in any detail today, but a big part of my research in my career has been around defining the fundamental design patterns. And when I teach university level courses, like you know, semester length courses, I teach everything around the design patterns. Because if you understand the fundamental design patterns of parallel programming, then you can move from one API to another and, and carry with you your algorithmic knowledge as you move around. So that, in my opinion, is the right way to teach parallel programming. And the fundamental pattern that you all know if you've done any MPI work is the SPMD pattern, single program multiple data. And the idea is that whether it's a process or a thread, I don't care. You're going to run a collection of them together. And they're all going to run the same program. That's the single program part. But they're all going to have their own little piece of the data they work with. That's the multiple data part. And you figure out how to split up work between them by looking at the ID and how, or rank and how many of them there are, they are. So the SPMD program is how a pattern is how, what, 99% of MPI programs are written? And a large number of open MP programs are written this way as well. Um, so this is the SPMD pattern being applied to the PI program. So hopefully you can all see this code. The font's a little smaller than I like. I apologize. But the red is where I added any lines to this code, the original serial code. So I have to have my my include file for function prototypes and any types. So include omp.h. And then I just, to keep this brain dead easy, because I want everything to fit on a single PowerPoint slide, I hardwire in the code how many threads I want. So I have pound define num threads two. All right? So I hardwire that. So now what I did is notice that the scalar sum I promoted to an array. And I'm doing that so that I can create a little piece of shared memory that every thread can independently write into. So I promoted sum to an array. This is like one of the oldest tricks in the book that we, all of us parallel programmers, MPI programmers, OpenMB programmers, we do this all the time. Promote your scalar to an array. Now what I could do is inside the code for this sum, I can now have each thread ID grab its piece of the array, and I know that that statement now will be race-free. So it's the just simplest way to quickly get a race-free update to a shared variable. So at any rate, I uh, have num threads. I have OMP set num threads. So now I enter my code, all right? Now I pick up the ID. ID equals OMP get thread num. And that's OK. It's not a race, because I declare int id inside the parallel region. And then I ask, how many threads did you give me? Now, you may be going, wait a minute. Why did I need to do that? Because I said up front, pound define num threads. But of course, a system could choose to give me fewer threads. So I have to ask inside the parallel region, how many threads did you actually give me? 
So that's why I have that statement, n threads equals OMP get num threads. Now, later on, after I do my loop, I'm going to need to sum the elements of my sum array. And to do that, I have to know how many threads I actually had, right? So what I need, but the problem is, if I declare the variable inside the parallel region, int n threads, is that what I called it? Yes, int n threads, what do you think the value of n threads is outside the parallel region? It goes out of scope. What happens in C when you go out of scope? What happens to a variable? It basically goes away, right? So I had to pick one thread, and I just arbitrarily picked ID equals zero. One thread, I saved its value of n threads, which has to be the same for all the threads in the team. But I said, look, one of them are going to write into n threads. OK, do, do you all see that? Does that make sense? Now, long, long ago, when I was much younger and didn't have a ponytail, and he's much younger, <laughs> I didn't do the if ID equals zero. I just said n threads, you know, num thread, n threads equals n threads, right? I just, I just had this statement without the if. And my reasoning was, look, everyone's writing the same value, so, you know, that's not a data race. Everyone's writing, say, two. And I have multiple threads writing two. So I don't care if it's a data race because they're all writing the same value. All right? And it always worked. Okay, so let me tell you. On an x86 system, it will work because we do atomic writes for free. You don't have to do anything. So x86 is very, very, has a very forgiving memory model. But there are other systems, ARM, and I believe Power, though I'm not absolutely sure on Power, where they do not do atomic writes. So you want to get in the habit, even if you're using a processor, as you know, working for Intel, of course I'm using x86 primarily. So I work for a processor that lets me do dumb and stupid. All right? Don't go there. <laughs> so only one thread. Even if they're writing the same value, have only one thread do it. So it's not a data race. All right? So now I needed to split up my uh, iterations between the threads. You know, I wanted one thread to get one set, another thread to get another set. I did the easy, the really, really easy approach. All right? i equals id, i less the num steps, increment by the number of threads. OK? This is like, uh, it's a cyclic distribution. If I think of my iterations as a big deck of cards, and I have sitting around the table in my card game the different threads, I'm just shuffling the iterations out around the table. So, you know, if I have two, th if I have four threads, one thread's going to get iteration zero, iteration four, iteration eight, iteration 12, the next thread's going to get iteration 1, iteration 5, iteration 9, iteration, whatever the numbers, right? OK? So that's what this cyclic distribution trick does with the loop. That way, I didn't have to compute an I start, I end, and deal with the fact that what if the number of iterations doesn't evenly divide the number of, doesn't, isn't evenly divided by the number of threads? I just threw all that out the window. I don't have to deal with it, all right? So then I ran it on my laptop, and I got 1.86 with one thread, 1.03 with two threads, 1.08 with three threads, 0 0.97. Isn't that great performance? No, that sucks. Sheesh. I mean, I saw some speed up. By the time I got to four threads on a dual core system, I got some nice speed up. What do you think is wrong with this approach? Any guesses? This is an absolutely critical concept. All right, it's called false sharing. I purposely gave you an exercise designed to have you stumble into false sharing. So here's what's happening. I have that array sum. And by making sure there's enough elements of sum so that each thread can write into its individual element, I know for a fact that I am not having a race condition. Everyone has their own piece of sum. There is no sharing going on, all right? However, 
Every microprocessor out there today has caches. So now imagine I've got this sum array. And here I have some 0, some 1, some 2, some 3. Okay, And then I have another processor. And some 1 is going to sit, most likely, will be sitting in the same cache line as some 0. So think about it. Thread number zero goes through and it goes, you know, it reads some zero, which goes to right back the value. Meanwhile, thread number two goes and it wants its sum. Oh, wait a minute, that cache line is over there. Ah, well, invalidate this cache line, go and read the next cache line. Zoom, slop, okay, over here. Meanwhile, thread number zero is ready to increment into sum again. Oh, this cache line is corrupt now. This cache line's been, you know, taken over by someone else. Invalidate my cache line, go get a next cache line, slosh. So what you're getting is every single time those threads, and remember, that's a little itty bitty loop. So they're hitting that again and again and again and again. And what's happening? Those cache lines are just bouncing back and forth, back and forth between level one caches. So it's called false sharing. It's a correct program. There is no data race. There is no undisciplined reading and writing into the same memory locations. But because they happen to be sharing cache lines, I'm getting this bouncing back and forth of the caches, and therefore I'm getting horrible performance. Does that all make sense? This is the danger of that promoting a scalar approach. So here's the easy fix. And I mention this because this is now we're getting obscure tricks, but you guys are all out there in supercomputing, and supercomputing is all about obscure tricks, right? Let's face it. That's, you know, you get your program running and then you obsess about every little trick you can use to get rid of performance bottlenecks. What if I take my sum array and I add a second dimension just to pad it out? And I pick that size so it's about the size of a cache line. So now I'm going to make sure that successive elements of sum that I care about are in different cache lines. All right? So I'm just padding the array to get rid of it. And therefore, I'm going to go ahead and run it again. Now it's my same SPMD program. Only change I made is I added that pad. And you can see, you know, 1.86 to 1.01 to 0.069 to 0.053. So that fixed it and made it really nice. Now what's the problem with that padding trick? It's hardware specific. If I move to a system with a different size cache line, then I have to change the pad. So this is not, in my opinion, a good solution. It's a solution from time to time you just have to use. But keep in mind, I, I, I really don't recommend that you go through and pad your arrays. So gosh, there better be a different way. Oh, there is. <laughs> but to talk about that, we need to move into the next module. All right, we're going to talk about synchronization.